This is ChestertonRadio.com. This is Frank Butler speaking for the management and staff of WCCO, taking this opportunity and this method to thank you, Mayor Humphrey, for the grand job you did reading the comic section of the Minneapolis Morning Tribune for all the boys and girls of the Northwest during radio's stay-at-home campaign. Now, listen. Well, it's 9-5, and time for all you kids to gather around your radios and listen to the funnies. This morning, we have an extra special guest in our studios, none other than the Honorable Hubert H. Humphrey, Mayor of Minneapolis. The mayor is doing his part in entertaining you boys and girls during this stay-at-home polio campaign. And now I see that Mayor Humphrey has turned to the first page of the funnies, and so we'll see how Blondie, Bugs Bunny, and Popeye, and all the rest are doing. (laughs) Mayor Humphrey... And the funny. Uh, Thank you very much. Good morning, boys and girls. You know, really, uh, this matter of having the mayor read funny papers, you know what happens when that uh, takes place too many times. There was a fellow down in New York City by the uh, name of Mayor LaGuardia. They called him the Little Flower. And one day, you know, he read the funny papers, and after that, they never elected the mayor again. In fact, they sent him over to Europe. Now, I don't want to take any long trips, so I suppose I better be just a little more careful this morning than usual how I read these funnies. Now, I got Skipper here with me and Nancy so that when I get home, I'm not going to have to uh, read these funnies again. They, they wanted to see what it was all about, and we start right off with Blondie. And you know what? It looks like Blondie and Dagwood are going to go out in a fishing party. Toby, you got any fishing music over yeah, there? Yeah, a little bit by the sea. Yeah, that's good. That's fine. Oh, listen to that. Now, just take a look at that. There's Dagwood, uh, uh, kids, and there's Dagwood right along. There's right alongside the, the lake shore there, and he says, I don't know why it is I can't catch a fish. Doesn't he look, oh, he just looks all down in the dumps, you know, and he just doesn't catch any fish. And over there's Cookie coming up with a whole string of fish, and Cookie's all dressed up there. She's looking wonderful. And there's Alexander. Alexander says, hey, Pop, look, Pop. And then Cookie says, look what I got, Daddy. And she's holding up the fish, and there's Blondie. She says, look, Dagwood. But old Dagwood, he just hasn't got any fish. He just can't catch them. And then we move along to the next one here, and and there's Dagwood. He's moving down the lake shore a little bit, and uh, he's got his fish pole and a can of worms there. And look at that funny hat on there, just like he's hunting lions. You see that, Skip? And he says... I have one of them, too. Oh, do you have... Sure, you have a hat like that. And and then uh, Dagwood says, they pull out fish as fast as they throw in their hooks. I guess I'll go further upstream. And there he is over here, way up the river... Uh, up alongside the river bank here, and he's looking down into the water looking for fish. He says, I've used everything, including chocolate e- eclairs, for bait. He just used everything, but he can't catch anything. So there he, there he goes, climbing up a tree right in the middle of the river. I don't know how he got out there without getting his feet wet, but there he's up a tree hanging off a branch, and he's got a spear in his hand. He says, I'll try spearing them like the old Indians did. And by golly, he can't, can't get a fish. And so he comes back on the bank, and he's taken on, now he's taken off his pants and he's taken off his hat and his shoes and his fish poles on the ground and the fish are jumping out of the water out there, you know, and he's just getting madder and madder. He says, there's just one way left, jumping in and catching them with my bare hands because, boy, that Dagwood, he's really angry because Cookie and Blondie and Alexander are catching all the fish. And he says, no, I... can't get any, can No, he can't catch any at all, Skipper. He says, I guess I, I, I just must be repulsive to fish. And the fish just don't like him, you see. And he's sitting in there in the middle of the river, and oh, he's madder in a wet hand. And he says, we're going home now, dear, Blondie says. And she's calling the Dagwood from the bank, and we caught all we can carry. And look at the fish they got, Skipper and Nancy. Look at all those fish. Why, they've got dozens and dozens of fish, and old Dagwood hasn't even caught a one. And here they are, just getting ready to go home. And uh-oh, there comes the chief of police. It looks just like Gene Bernath or McLean, one of those good Minneapolis policemen there, you know, and... And here he comes along, and he says, Fishing on private property, huh? Without a license, huh? Is that a policeman? Oh, that's a policeman, you betcha. Without and a license. And a long nose. Oh, he got a long nose, yeah. I wonder who that... That's a funny-looking guy, all right. He says, Well, come along with me, the old policeman says. Look at that big badge he's got on there. Oh, he's mad, old oh boy. So the policeman takes him down to the county judge. Oh, oh, right down there. See, here they're coming into the county judge, and these judges, when they find people that are catching too many fish, they really don't like it, and they they may be going to fine him or send him to jail. You're not under arrest, he says to, the old policeman says to uh, Dagwood, you didn't catch any fish. And Dagwood says, really? 
And there he's sitting outside the county judge, and he's just laughing. He says, ha, 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 the laugh's on them. After all, I'm the lucky one in the end. Ha, ha, ha. And that old Dagwood didn't catch any fish. See, there he is. And then he, Blondie comes out and says, we were fined five dollars apiece. Give me fifteen dollars, dear. And old Dagwood just falls over, plop on the ground. He didn't catch any fish, and now he's got to pay a fifteen dollar fine. So you can just see that Dagwood just gets in trouble one time right after another. That's why a little more of that fishing music. Oh, Dagwood's a bad fisherman. Now this one here's a here's a really good one today, though. This Bugs Bunny. You know, this Bugs Bunny is a he's a homeless looking rabbit I ever hope to see. Look at those teeth he's got down there. Big buck teeth hanging out in front there. But Bugs likes to go on out and take a lot of exercise, so he's out alongside of Lake Calhoun, it looks like here. Or maybe it's out just out in the country. He's got a horse and he's gonna go for a ride. This is to the Winnie and Canter stables. And look at that horse. That's the sickest looking horse. Well, that old horse doesn't look like it can even walk. His eyes aren't even open. Just looks like he's been out all Saturday night or sometime. He says, since I sold my plane, this is Bugs Bunny, you know, he's talking out loud to himself. He says, since I sold my plane, baby, you're going to be my mode of transportation again. This Bugs is a tough rabbit. And then just as he's getting on the horse, like, uh, well, what are you waiting for, you old hay burner? Get going, stupid. Bugs is talking to the horse, and the horse just looks back sort of sick like, you know, you don't even want to go anyplace. All he wants to do is lie down and go to sleep. And here comes an old cowboy. Look at him with a great big hat and red shirt on and blue pants and high boots. He says, you ain't been riding your horse for a long time, have you, dude? And Bug says, no, I ain't a creeper along and he don't want to budge. What's ailing the critter? And then the old cowboy says, why, he's plumb forgot how to tote a rider. You've got to refresh his memory. He's got to watch another horse being rid. And Bugs is standing right up on the horse, and the horse's back is bending down there looking like he's going to fall dead on the ground. And Bugs says, well, haul out another nag, and let's let him in. Let's let him watch how it's done. And then the uh, cowboy says, they're all out being rid, all these nags of ours, and you'll have to wait till one comes in before we can give him the idea. But Bugs, oh, he's a smart rabbit. He doesn't wait for the horses to come back. He says, I ain't got all day. I'll give him an idea a lot quicker and a lot better. I'll be right back. So Bugs Bunny, he gets off his horse and he runs downtown. Lickety split looks like he's going downtown to one of these toy stores, maybe up at one of these uh, fine stores we have down here in Minneapolis. And here he buys a wooden horse that's got a spring in it and a little fellow's riding it. And he comes running back. He says, a little teen horse and rider, what moves? Pretty good for a dude, but... And then the old horse looks at this horse, this toy horse, jumping on the ground and he says... He's learned again from this little horse. It's all come back to him how to carry a rider in fine style. I'm off for a smooth ride, says Bugs Bunny. And old Bugs gets on the old horse, and the horse is charging down the track just like he's got firecrackers under his feet. Just to go on. All right, little horsey music there. That's fine. Well, you're doing wonderfully on the sound effects, and the mayor is certainly doing himself proud on reading the funnies to his two children. But now Toby Prince is going to come through with some music, music he thinks that you kiddies will enjoy this morning. Toby's been sitting here just waiting to sing, doing what comes naturally. Yeah. Toby. Sounds like it might be what Bugs Bunny did, doesn't That's it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Folks are dumb where I come from, ain't had any learning. Still the happy as can be, doing what comes naturally. Doing what comes naturally. Folks like us could never fuss with schools and books and learning. Still, we've gone from A to Z. Doing what comes naturally. Doing what comes naturally. You don't have to know how to read or write if you're out with the fella in the pale moonlight. You don't have to be from a great big town not to go picking berries in an evening gown. That comes naturally. Oh, so naturally, my uncle down in Texas, he can't even write his name. He signs his checks with X's, but they cash him just the same. Grandpa Dick was always sick, but never saw a doctor. He just died at 93, doing what comes naturally, doing what comes naturally. You don't have to go to a private school, not pick up a penny near a stubborn mule. You don't have to have a professor's don't, not to go for the honey when the bees are home. That comes naturally, oh, so naturally. My uncle don't pay taxes, 
his address he never gives. They can't collect his taxes, for they don't know where he lives. Uncle Ben got angry when they got him stealing chickens. I'm within my rights, he says, doing what comes naturally, doing what comes naturally. Ah, the mayor says that Toby's good. Well, and the little kitty's the nod their heads. Like well, now back to Mayor Humphrey and more of the fun. Oh, thanks a lot. But now, listen, before we get back on these funnies, you know, we've got to announce, uh, kitties, uh, the winners for the best drawing last week of a four-legged animal. Nancy, didn't you send in a drawing on a four-legged animal? Mm-hmm. Oh, mm-hmm. You had yours with ribbons on it. Well, Nancy didn't win. Uh, surely, they surely are apparently judging these things very, very honestly up here. Now, <laughs> now here's little Warren Werner. He's age 10 at the St. Hubert Hotel out at Millbank, South Dakota. Nancy, your mother and I have stayed out there at the St. Hubert Hotel out in Millbank, South Dakota. And Warren Werner, age 10, wins a prize. And then there's Bonnie Christofferson, age 10, at Ogama, Wisconsin. And then there's Darlene Lyons at Spirit Lake, Iowa. And Billy Eckert, uh, age 10, of Glencoe, Minnesota. And then the last one, the last winner in last week's contest was Adele Remy, Husenfeldt. Age 11, 2909, Bloomington Avenue, Minneapolis. Well, we got one Minneapolis girl in on that. That's really good. Who's now, today? Well, now, I tell you, Skipper, see, this, this funny paper, the next funny we're going to read is called The Sad Sack. And is this fellow a sad sack? You know what a sad sack is? What? A sad sack is a fellow that just doesn't quite know why he's, where he's going, what he's going to do, or why he's even alive, see? And this fellow, sad sack, his hair is a standing up there. He doesn't, he hasn't even combed his hair. And what's he doing? Of course, there's nothing to read in this funny paper. I'll just have to tell you about it because there isn't any words. Uh, uh, just, uh, there just isn't a word on the whole paper. But here's what he's doing. See, Sad Sack comes up to the house, and he's got posies in his hand there, you know. And he's standing out there, you know, and he's, he's just saying to this girlfriend of his that's come to the door, and, oh, you know, she's just all, mm, she's so glad she's got a boyfriend. And Sad Sack is saying, can I come on in? And, and uh, the, uh, the girlfriend, she's pointing into the door, you know, and she says, come on in, Sad Sack. Come on in and meet the folks. So Sad Sack comes in and meet the folks, and oh, man, oh, man, he comes on up. It must be some of the in-laws, because when he, when he comes up to meet the first person, and that first one gives him a cold, icy stare, and poor old Sad Sack almost falls on the floor. Look at him, he's shaking all over there, you know. I suppose the girls may be introducing him to her folks, her mother and her father, but my goodness, they... Hey, look it. Yeah, I know that. Huh? Isn't, isn't, he, isn't that a, a bad-looking person? And then, you know, Sad Sack is introduced to the daddy, to the girl's daddy. And the daddy is a great, big, tough guy. I guess he's just been eating all the breakfast food in the world and getting tougher and rougher, and he puts his hand out and he grabs Sad Sack's, and poor old Sad Sack's hand just crumbles and crackles, and he'll have to go to the hospital. And now we got Sad Sack coming in to meet the little boy, the little brother. And that little brother, he doesn't look like some of the little brothers I've seen around. He's a really a tough-looking fellow and hasn't combed his hair in three weeks, you know. And there he stands there, and just as Sad Sack is being introduced, what does he do? He pulls out a water gun, and he squirts some smack-bang in the eye, you know, and he hollers, bang. Boy, he's just a mean guy. And then Sad Sack... Uh, He figures it can't be any worse now, and he's dripping wet, and he's standing there with his coat shrinking up, you know, and his girlfriend says, now meet the doggy, meet the doggy. And what does the doggy do? The doggy hasn't had anything to eat for about two weeks, apparently. And and so the doggy just grabs, he just, look at it, look at it, he does this. He grabs the little sad sack right in the leg and bit him right smack bang just above the ankle. Well, Sad Sack has gotten through all of that, and now everybody's left the room, you know, and he's going to have a chance to say some nice things to his girlfriend. She says, come on over here, Sad Sack, and sit down on the, sit down on the Davenport. Everybody's going out now. And so Sad Sack comes over and sits down on the Davenport, and you see what happens? When he sits down, a spring breaks loose, and it cracks him, and he jumps up in the air about three feet, and the poor guy is running out of the house here in this last picture. He's given up. I don't think Sad Sack will ever go with another girl. Love a little closer. Lovey. Oh, this is Sad Sack. Oh, is that Sad Sack? Well, love and be my little Well, now, folks, uh, kitties, we're just going to have to change there. Sad Sack didn't have much to say today. He, he just got in an awful lot of trouble. But here we come to one of our big favorites, and that's Lil Abner. Now, Lil Abner is my favorite. I want to tell you that Lil Abner, he's one of the nicest fellows and one of the dumbest that I suppose anybody ever met. Now, just take... There's Mammy, though. Mammy Yoakum. Ah, what a fine lady that Mammy Yoakum is. I tell you, that Mammy Yoakum can do anything. And so, you remember last week, uh, there was a big mystery. Somebody said something about, who is the greatest? 
the greatest. They don't know the greatest what. They're just looking for who's the greatest. And here is the whole Ms. Mammy Yoakum, you know, she came over to Available Jones. Now, Available Jones, you all know all about him. He can get you anything that you want. So, little Mammy comes over and says, Available, who is the greatest? What do he do that he's the greatest? And why does you hesitate to turn him loose? And Available Jones, he's all mixed up. He says, because what he's the greatest at, it's, a, it's dangerous to have that much of. Ah, and then I, I got a common... I... I got a commune with nature. Oh, Mammy, nature, shall I turn him loose or not? That's the old available Jones thing. He gets out there and see the moon, that great big moon, it's dark at night, he's got to come out and he says, commune with nature, you know. He's got to get the message whether or not he should tell who is the greatest. And there was thunder and a lightning, and a stern voice seemed to say, don't do it, available, don't do it. So I'll do it, says available. That's the funny thing. I'll do anything for a price, says available. That's my motto, folks. Anything for a price. And there comes the Labner back to see Available Jones. There's signs on the wall up there that says, Babies minded, dry babies five cents, and wet babies 15 cents. <laughs> and, and then there's little Abner standing there, and he's got a green tie on this morning. And he says, little Available Jones to him says, Young Yoakum, I want you to go east, misery, and bring back the greatest. Bring back the greatest. But what is he the greatest at, says little Abner. Of course, little Abner, he'll do anything, you know. And little and available says, Dope, I'll pretend I didn't hear that, you young fool. Just ask anyone in the East, Misery, who the greatest is. And they all know, poor souls, says available Jones. And if you get the idea you're greater than he is, don't challenge him. Take my word for it. He's the greatest, says available Jones. So the Latin says, okay, he's the greatest. Yes, son, he's the greatest. The way he starts walking down the road with those great big shoes of his on, there he is in the East Misery. And he says, here's the Latin sitting on a park bench. My goodness, everybody seems to be resting in this town. And he says, I got to ask somebody who's the greatest. The folks who's been sleeping might resent it if I disturb them, but those folks ain't doing nothing. And there's a couple over there sitting on the park bench, a young boy and a young girl, and my goodness, they're looking in each other's eyes. And the, and the girl says, ah, Ah, you're great. Is he the greatest? Says the Labner. Him, the greatest? <laughs> Compared to the greatest, he's a rank amateur, says the girl, you know. And there the poor fellow looks just hard and says, Dope. Compared to the greatest, who isn't? And the Labner, he just gasps and sighs again. He says, The search goes on. That little Labner boy, he really goes after things. He says, My sweethearts and I, we're all together. Ah, Walter, you're great. He hears that coming out of a house. He hears somebody saying, you're great. And you, Andy, even greater, you're even greater than Walter. But you, Harvey, you're the greatest. And boy, that's what little Abner heard. And bang, he charges in the door and he says, the greatest. Ah, done, found him at last. There's that little Abner boy, always getting things done. Oh, he's really great. Now, let's see. Should we have him? I think we should. Okay. Let's have her. Uh, Mr. Humphrey, we're going to have a song by Toby Prince, the original sad sack song. Toby, take over with Put Your Arms Around Me. Cuddle up a little closer, lovey, lovey mine. Cuddle up and be my little thing, clinging by. Like to feel your cheeks so rosy, like to make you comfy, cozy. Cause I love from head to toesy, love be mine. Oh, put your arms around me, I'll get to it. <laughs> mine, cuddle up and cuddle up and all the time. Oh, oh, where'd you get those eyes? Eyes that I just idolize. When you look at me, my heart begins to float. Then it starts rocking like a motorboat. Oh, oh, I never knew any girl like you. Very well done, Mr. Prin, sir. And the mayor has now Popeye in front of him, so let's go, Mayor. Oh, Please. sure. Say, Toby, that was very, very good. Of course, little Abner would love to have heard that song when he was out there in the park. Bench. Nothing. Popeye's been on a vacation or something. I don't know. He, he apparently took two or three weeks off, and he's gone away and uh, right at home there, sitting on a little stool. Get your papers now. Look on that very first picture. There's a... I think that's Sweet Pea. And Sweet Pea is looking at a letter from Popeye, and he says, Popeye writes upside down. You know how Sweet Pea talks just like, his, uh, like Popeye does. And Popeye, the sailor man. 
And uh, then you get over here, and there you see Sweet Pea sitting down in front there of uh, uh, somebody in the house. I guess that looks like some, that must be his auntie. And he says, try turning the letter around, Sweet Pea, says Daddy. For what? Says Sweet Pea. Well, blow me down. <laughs> and old Sweet Pea turns the letter around. It says, what does it say on that letter? It says, dear Sweet Pea, how are you? I am having a swell time. Wish you was here. Bye-bye. And Sweet Pea, oh, he just loves to hear, you know, from Popeye. Ah, he loves him very much. And he says, you answer it. This is what the... I guess that's the maid it must be, or is that an, is that an auntie? Aunt is that Aunt Joan? Aunt, Joan? Aunt Jones. Oh, yes, that... Oh, I, she's... Well, I see she's got her hair done up differently today. That's why I didn't recognize her. So there's Aunt Joan. She says to Sweet Pea, you answer it, Sweet Pea, and I'll address an envelope for you. Okay. Uh, Sweet Pea, you know, he got the bottle of ink out now, and he's right down there on the floor, and he's just getting rip-snorting, raring mad. He says, heck, I never could use a pen with a fine point. You needs a blunt point to write to a real good friend. And here comes Aunt Jones back, says, you might like all, uh, like one of these pens. And then here's Sweet Pea down the floor again. He's got ink all over there. My goodness, he's going to fill up that ink bottle. He says, is this all, is this all the ink there is, Aunt Jones? The bottle is half empty. You know, that, that, that little sweet pea's got a bad voice for a little guy. <laughs> now, Uncle Ray, I'm sure, could do this voice much better here, but... Uh, and here's sweet pea. He's gotten a hold of some boxes now, and he's going out to mail the letter, and he says, Popeye is on a vacation, and he will want to know what's going on here. Ah, uh, now we're way down in the deep South Sea Islands, and here's Popeye. That's that quick, fast mail service boy right by airplanes over the Northwest Airlines or Mid-Continent. I guess they took it right on out there to the Orient. And said, and here's uh, Popeye, and he's walking down. It says, Pust Office, one block. And here's Popeye. Say, ah, a letter for me. I hope there's nothing wrong. And then he gets the letter, and on the letter, there's just a whole lot of scribbling on the back. It looks just kind of like the letters you write to me, Skipper. And just a whole lot of scribbling, and there's Popeye sitting or lying down on the beach right out there in the South Sea Islands. He says, now I can relax on account of everything is all right at home. <laughs> oh, that Popeye, he loves that sweet pea. Well, that's all there is about Popeye this time. Now, I guess, uh, do we have a moment here to get Dick Tracy? Oh, I, I think so. Oh, yes, I've yes. just got to read Dick Tracy. <laughs> all right, just a little bit. All right, now, you know what's been happening to Dick Tracy. Uh, uh, be old okay. plenty. <laughs> uh, he's been, uh, he's really been taken into tow by Gravel Gertie. Now, oh, Gravel Gertie looks beautiful today. It come, there they are, just getting ready to be married. Here comes the judge up, and everybody is coming along. And come on now, they're all ready, says Gravel Gertie, and he'll be all plenty. There he is, spitting tobacco juice. Gravel Gertie just couldn't get him to stop that. She says, darn you, she says, take off that hat. She says to be all plenty. My friends, the minister says, we are gathered together here to witness this union in wedlock of... And over here, they got music coming from... Well, these are real police cars. There isn't a police car in Minneapolis that plays any music like that. I'll tell you that. We've got to look into that, kids. We're going to have music in the police cars. I love you truly, they're singing. Oh, boy. Then here's a commercial that says, Hoop and Saps Department Store dedicates this number to Gravel Gertie and B.O. Plenty, who are being married today. And here's the minister back again, and there's B.O. Plenty spitting pity again right over his left shoulder. Do you, B.O. Plenty, promise to take this woman who you now hold by the hand and all the friends as long as your lawful wedded wife, so long as you both shall live? Why, sure, he says. <laughs> Why not? And do you, Gravel Gertie, take this man? Jingle, jangle, super soul for the tootsies and the throat. That comes out of the police car again. We've just got to do something about that around here. For your, then the minister says, do you promise, Gravel, Gravel Gertie, to take this man for your lawful wedded husband? Boy, she's anxious like the girls are. She says, I do. And now the minister says, and now I pronounce you man and wife. Ah, uh, there's a hand coming off in the distance, says, be old plenty. Yes, sir, Mr. Be old plenty. Now, come with me. You are under arrest. Huh? Here's Mr. Macy, Mr. Dacey, I mean, Mr. Tracy. There's Dick Tracy. Huh? What are you talking about, officer? And the officer says, Judge Hayes died last night. And Judge Nolan, who has replaced him on the bench, has canceled be old plenty's bond. And here's the warrant for his arrest. Oh, Dick Tracy said, why, this must be a gag. And there's Gravel Gertie, and she's fading, and she says, eek! <laughs> I wish it were, Mr. Tracy, says the policeman. But you know Judge Nolan. And there's the picture of Judge Nolan back in the chambers of the courthouse, and he says, I never did like the way that Judge Hayes admitted be all plenty to bond. That man's a menace, a dangerous character. And here's the man that helps the judge says, have another bismuth judge. Everybody has indigestion children, you know, in this uh, picture of D Dick Tracy. But B.O. Plenty's in trouble again. 
You've been listening to the mayor of Minneapolis, Hubert H. Humphrey, doing his part in entertaining you boys and girls during the present polio epidemic. WCCO concludes its part in this installment of the Fun at Home radio broadcast brought to the children of the Northwest area by the radio stations in this area. And now for listeners in the metropolitan area of the Twin Cities, the next unit, beginning immediately, will originate from station WMIN. The Wings Over Jordan program canceled this morning will be heard next Sunday at its regular time. Good and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com.